everybody. Uh, good to see such a great audience here still as we're getting into the afternoon. Um, I think you're going to have a really exciting panel in front of you, uh, really thinking about how we take this amazing innovation and get it into the marketplace to begin addressing the, the challenges we have in front of us and, and figuring out those solutions. So I'll jump right in here and introduce the panel, starting with uh, Joseph Heiser, who is the Managing Principal for the Energy Futures Initiative, uh, also a professor of the practice um, for the, the Wilson, sorry, Wilton E. Uh, Scott Institute for Energy Innovation here at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Joseph Heiser, I actually had the pleasure of interacting a bit with he and Dave Foster and crew and Secretary Moniz um, as he was with uh, the Secretary at the Department of Energy um, and a, a fellow Principal Melanie A. Kenderdine in the, in the founding of the Energy Futures Initiative. Next we'll go on to Rand uh, Randall Gentry. Uh, he's the Deputy Director, uh, Science and Technology and Strategic Plans and Programs, um, the Acting Executive Director for Research Innovation Center um, at the National Energy Technology Lab. Uh, Randy Gentry is the, is the Deputy Director and he's built uh, the success of NETL's collaborations with DOE on strategic initiatives, uh, the Annual Laboratory Plan and the Fossil Energy Roadmap and Grand Challenges Endeavors. Next we have Dr. Marianne Walk. Uh, provides leadership and direction um, and integration for research and science and technology at the Idaho, Idaho National Laboratory in her role um, as a Deputy Lab Director for Science and Technology and Chief Research Officer, uh, formerly the Vice President of Sandia National Labs uh, Laboratories California Laboratory. Next we've got Paul Browning, who was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer of Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems Americas, incorporated on April 1st of 2016 and oversees all Western Hemisphere business activities. Mr. Browning has extensive global leadership experience in distributed and central power generation, as well as North American midstream and downstream oil and gas operations. Mr. Browning is also an alumnus of the College of Engineering uh, right here at CMU. see two more. We've got Evan Michelson, who is a PhD and, and program director of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, Dr. Michelson is responsible for overseeing the foundation's energy and environment program, which seeks to advance understanding about the economic, environmental, and security and policy trade-offs associated with the increased deployment of low and no carbon uh, resources and technologies across the energy system. And last but not least, we have Sebastian Lunas. Um, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Sebastian um, joined Ian Gurr. Uh, Elon. Elon, thank you, Elon Gurr, to launch um, the Cyclotron Road in July of 2014, and directs the program's communications efforts as well as a supporting uh, supporting recruitment and program operations. So as you can see, we've got a wealth of information here, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Heiser to lead the conversation. Thank All right, you. thank you very much for the kind introductions. Um, it's getting a little late in the afternoon, but I think we're gonna have a very interesting discussion. We'll keep you all very occupied. Let me start off by asking a question. How many of you all here are baseball fans? Anybody? Yeah, about half. Uh, I, I, so excuse me for a moment if I use kind of a baseball pun here, but I think when you look down the row of the people to the right of me, I think you'll see a lot of heavy hitters. And I think Given the topic for our discussion of amplifying the impact of uh, clean energy uh, technologies, uh, what we really want to do is, is today, is, is this afternoon, is sort of play cleanup in the sense that we want to kind of go back and kind of cover some of the topics that came up in the discussions that took place yesterday and today and go back and hit on some of those topics. And of course, there was a lot of discussion both yesterday and today about different forms of generation. We had uh, uh, speakers here talk about cheap gas. We've had speakers talk about even cheaper solar. We've had discussions about uh, the rate of market penetration of renewable energy. We had discussions about some of the issues with nuclear power. So I thought we might start off at, at, with, uh, with that topic. And I want to start off with a question about that and I think what I want to do is, is start off by asking that question to, uh, to my colleague here, uh, uh, Paul, who amongst all of us here is really the, the practitioner 
in a sense that he's out in the field every day marketing these technologies to uh, uh, project developers and utilities. So let me ask you the question about where do you see the market right now for clean energy technologies and how do you see the various, these various forms of generation kind of stacking up and competing against each other? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, I'll say my, uh, the end of my fiscal year is March 31st, and um, I've got a guy who's trying to land a $400 million order for me right now. So if I get a phone call, I'm going to take it. <laughs> but um, so, um, you know, I, I work for Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems. We do everything from, you know, coal-fired power generation, nuclear, natural gas, offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, renewables, storage. And so we are playing across, you know, a broad part of the power generation sector. And what we've been seeing uh, for sure here in the United States and to varying degrees around the world is uh, we're seeing a combination of natural gas and renewables have been displacing uh, more costly and more carbon intensive uh, power generation technologies. Um, you know, a 50-50 combination of, well, well, natural gas on its own is about 65% more carbon efficient than a retiring coal-fired power plant. And a combination of natural gas and renewables 50-50 is about 85% more carbon efficient. And so, um, and they're also now more cost effective than both coal and nuclear. And so we've been seeing uh, the retirements of coal and nuclear, and we've been seeing uh, the new build is, you know, almost all uh, a combination of natural gas and renewables. Um, as th this has happened over the last, you know, 15 years, um, you know, we've actually sponsored Carnegie Mellon to do a, uh, a, a U.S. power sector carbon intensity index. And uh, once a quarter on www.emissionsindex.org, they uh, update you know, where the US power sector is in carbon intensity. And what they've, uh, they just had their latest update today. And what it showed is that um, uh, in the la since 2005, carbon intensity of the US grid is down 29%. I don't think a lot of people are super aware of that. I think most people, you hear sort of doom and gloom from a climate change point of view, but that combination of natural gas and renewables and the retirement of coal has really um, had a, a huge beneficial imp impact on the carbon intensity of the U.S. power grid. And we're seeing similar things happen around the world. Um, in the Middle East, it's more replacing oil with the com oil fired power generation with a combination of gas and, and renewables. In Asia, there's still a lot of coal being built, but the amount of new coal being built is being reduced. And instead, they're starting to build more natural gas and more renewables. So, um, you know, I, I, and, and actually the same thing's true in China, uh, the same thing's true in India. So although, you know, there's pluses and minuses in all these markets depending on what their local availability and cost of natural gas is. So, um, but you know, that, that kind of, that phenomenon is, is really what we've been seeing for the last decade plus. I would say one thing that's very different in the last couple of years is that storage is really becoming uh, something that all of my customers are talking to me about. They're all, uh, some of them are, are beginning to make investments, in, especially in places like California where they're getting a market signal now. They're, you know, they've got enough renewables penetration that they're seeing uh, negative electricity prices uh, due to the duck curve that everybody knows about. That's really the market signal that you need storage. And so, uh, we're, you know, in, in places like California, we're seeing a lot of interest in storage, but I would say even more broadly, you know, there's a lot of people who feel like even if their storage isn't something they want today, it's definitely something they're going to need soon. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a good overview, and I appreciate that. But I noticed in your discussion that uh, you were relatively less optimistic, shall we say, about nuclear and, and, and coal in terms of where its prospects are in the market. So uh, let me pick up on those two for a moment, and why don't we talk a little bit more and a deeper dive on, on those two topics. So let me turn to uh, Marianne next. Um, uh, we've had a lot of discussion here both again yesterday and today about nuclear, primarily about the current nuclear fleet in the U.S. and uh, what its future fate might be. Also a little bit of discussion about uh, advanced reactors and I want to really talk, uh, ask Marianne to talk about the, the, the latter. And I think there's a, a little bit of a kind of a quiet revolution that had been taking place in the advanced nuclear uh, reactor technology space, there are maybe as many as a dozen companies who have been working in this area very quietly with private, backed by, primarily by private capital, probably on the order of over $100 million, I would guess, cumulatively. 
And um, within the Department of Energy, the uh, Idaho National Laboratory is really the lead national laboratory involved in the research and development uh, of uh, advanced nuclear reactor technologies. And uh, I'd like uh, Marianne to talk a little bit about what INL is doing to help uh, uh, advance these, this next generation of uh, nuclear technologies that uh, someday will, will, will come to the market and uh, uh, hopefully will be competitive. Yes, thank you very much. I'd be happy to do that. Um, as Joe mentioned, Idaho National Laboratory is the nation's nuclear energy laboratory sponsored by the DOE uh, <laughs> Office of Nuclear Energy. And we do quite a bit in the area of nuclear science and technology, as well as running some major facilities out on the site west of Idaho Falls, where we currently have four uh, operating nuclear reactors. Over the history, you may not realize this, this is the 70th year that we've had a national reactor test station, which evolved into Idaho National Laboratory. And over the years, there have been 52 different nuclear reactors out on the site west of Idaho Falls. Just a fun fact for you. So, so what's happening in new nuclear these days, it's really focusing on small and really small reactors. So you probably heard about small modular reactors. This, has been, this idea has been around for quite some time. And there's a company called New Scale in Oregon that is, has submitted a license application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to build a modular six pack, or is it 12 pack actually, of 60 megawatt light water reactors. And this reactor is going to be located on the Idaho National, National Laboratory site. We're hoping for a you know, it, some preliminary approvals as early as next year, and they're hoping to have this demonstration reactor built by 2026. And this would include uh, Idaho National Laboratory using two of these 60 megawatt modules for R&D activities. And they have, New Scale has already um, entered an agreement with the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, or UAMPS, which is a consortium of 45 community-owned utilities over eight western states to purchase, and they're working on a power purchase agreement with the Department of Energy, which is not yet finalized, but it's, it's being worked. So that's one thing, and that's light water technology, with the idea that if we can <coughs> figure out how to build these things smaller and cheaper, that we might be able to continue to use that particular technology in a commercial power generation facility. But we're also working on microreactors, which I think is a pretty exciting technology for uh, the nuclear industry right now. This is being actually really pushed by the Department of Defense. And as you know, DOD is often a good first adopter of new technologies uh, in many different sectors, and the energy sector is no uh, no exception to that. Several different technologies are being put forth by, I believe it's on as many, I've heard as many as 18 different small companies that are developing reactor designs. And there, there are a variety of different types, mostly not light water reactors, most things like molten salt reactors, high temperature gas reactors, sodium fast reactors. Reactors that operate at higher temperatures but lower pressures. And, and don't require refueling as often either. So these would be reactors that are from a couple of megawatts, maybe up to about 20 megawatts. They could be used for things like forward operating bases. They could be mobile. They could be taken into very small communities and just provide and replace diesel generation, say in remote communities in, uh, in Alaska or anywhere where you would need uh, something that was portable, it's hard to get things into your community, and that's uh, one of the potential uses for these microreactors. So DOD has already had an industry day for this microreactor project, and we're hoping t this will be, uh, also would be cited at the Idaho National Laboratory, and that there would be a demonstration reactor, followed by commercialization. So that's another thing that is, is going on in the uh, nuclear uh, area. There's two other things I want to mention very briefly. Uh, of course, I could go on all day, but I can't. Uh, one is the versatile test reactor, which was just announced by the Department of Energy that will be 
is authorized, and that's um, a fast spectrum test reactor to provide that capability to the United States, which has not had that capability in several decades and is needed for non light water reactors uh, to advance. And then finally, I also want to mention that we're working with um, the National Energy Technology Laboratory and also the National Renewable Energy Te Laboratory, NREL, on a set of things around integrated energy systems that would uh, integrate nuclear, both electricity and heat, with renewables and fossil energy into some hybrid energy systems that could con uh, conceivably repurpose some of our existing light water fleet. So I will stop there and let okay. some other people talk. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a lot of, uh, lot of activity in the nuclear space, and, and, and again, a lot of it that has not gotten a whole lot of uh, publicity and, and attention. So, so let's then shift to coal, which uh, has also gotten a lot of attention here. And, and as we've, I think, heard in various uh, talks in the last two days, uh, coal seems to be facing a kind of a two-pronged issue on the one hand, uh, the challenge of just simply the economics of the existing uh, coal-fired fleet um, and the second challenge being one of uh, meeting the, uh, uh, the needs and desires for decarbonization. And so I want to kind of go to that second question a bit and uh, ask Randy Gentry to talk a little bit about some of the work that's being done now at the uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory we heard a presentation on that yesterday from the from the new director, Brian Anderson. But I'd like Randy, if he could, just to uh, again, in the spirit of amplification, to maybe amplify a little bit more about uh, what they're doing in terms of uh, uh, moving forward in the innovation space on uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, yes, thank you, Joe. I, I appreciate the question. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, sibling laboratories representing the Department of Energy and uh, research in that space, uh, in addition to Cyclotron Road um, and uh, many of our other partners uh, in that space as well. So the carbon capture represents one part of our portfolio. We're a little bit different of a, a laboratory uh, at the National Energy Technology Laboratory and that we're a little bit more distributed. So we have a laboratory here in Pittsburgh, we have a laboratory in Morgantown, West Virginia, and we have a laboratory in Albany, Oregon. Um, so aside from being ge geographically confused at all times, it does give us an opportunity to spread our research uh, across uh, geographical space and very niche uh, opportunities as well across that space. And so much of our carbon capture, storage, and utilization um, occurs across that different space as well. So a lot of that carbon capture and utilization uh, research does occur here in the Pittsburgh area in addition to uh, the Albany, Oregon space where we're looking at uh, some of the unique materials uh, research opportunities. So a lot of that does uh, include catalysis research. Uh, some of it may be membrane, some of it may be uh, mixed uh, matrix type uh, oxide and uh, framework type uh, materials that we're looking at uh, new opportunities and new materials actually. Uh, some of that may include um, uh, new advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing uh, type opportunities in that space where actually we're looking at opportunities for partnership across the laboratory uh, system uh, where uh, 3D printing particularly is coming up with some new structures uh, actually which have optimized uh, some interesting ways uh, where the flue gas and, and other space uh, interactions uh, have been <coughs> optimized. So um, uh, there's interesting opportunity in that space across coal particularly, but also if you don't mind me adding, uh, across the natural gas space as well. The flue gas across those two is very different. Uh, it does require uh, a different research um, uh, uh, type of opportunity. Uh, so you do have to evaluate both of those flue gases uh, to, to look at how one might approach that. But from the coal perspective, I believe the comment was yesterday, uh, as each coal car comes through, think of 80% uh, of that going into the atmosphere. That's assuming that you're not capturing it on the backside. Uh, and then doing something with it. Uh, our hope from a research perspective is that we are capturing that 
uh, and that we perhaps may also be utilizing that in some context to create uh, new materials, which we are attempting to evaluate with uh, some new uh, nano catalysts in our program, uh, particularly gold nano catalysts and some other uh, p potential copper nano catalysts as well. And then the storage opportunities as well, uh, geologic storage, uh, some of which um, also includes enhanced oil recovery as an opportunity. Uh, some of that uh, is commoditized. Uh, there is a market for that, uh, which we're also evaluating. Uh, so I think there's plenty of potential in that space for continued research. Okay. Th th thank you, Randy. I think I, what I'd like to do now, maybe shift gears a little bit. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this from the perspective of you know, some of the major institutions. And, and I'd like to maybe address it a little bit from the, you know, kind of the innovation and the innovator standpoint. And maybe first I'd like to maybe turn to, uh, to Evan for a moment and question. Evan, you're representing a, a foundation. And uh, foundations, I think, are, play a very important role in, as a source of funding. And oftentimes we find foundations supporting work that's really on is really on the thought leadership edge of things. And, and I, but we don't really know a whole lot about how foundations work. And so I guess what I wanted to, Evan, the question I wanted to put to you, if you can talk to us a little bit about in the uh, clean energy innovation space, um, how the Sloan Foundation is kind of looking at the landscape in that area and what you're doing to try and look on the horizon and even over the horizon in terms of uh, clean energy technology. Great, thanks so much. So um, there's an old adage that goes basically when you sort of get to know one foundation, you know one foundation. And that's very true uh, in theory and in practice because as you said, um, each individual foundation is different. Um, but uh, one of the things that's really exciting about being at the Sloan Foundation is that we focus on funding basic academic research in the social sciences and in the natural sciences. Um, there are a lot of foundations, obviously, in the clean energy space that do lots of other good work, uh, uh, not in the, on the research side of things. Uh, but one of the distinctive things about our program at Sloan is that we really focus on uh, supporting basic academic research. And one of the exciting things is that that means that uh, me as the program director gets to be out in the research community to really try to understand what's happening, what's coming down the road, um, and, and how we can sort of support that work. So there are lots of strategies that we use. Um, as you can imagine, I get a substantial number of inquiries uh, for folks in the research community looking for funding. But even more so, one of my jobs is to go out into the research community and go to conferences, read the literature, be steeped in the fields in which we work and support to truly try to understand what are the interesting and innovative research projects that are coming down the line. One of the other things that we do um, is we have a number of open call for proposals. So at the moment, we have two open calls for proposals uh, for, for projects that work on two specific areas that I think are kind of new and innovative. One on the role of sensors to better monitor and measure energy environmental systems, and then research projects that look at net zero or negative emissions technologies and interventions. So one of the things that we do is we use a whole number of different strategies to really try to identify these really interesting topics and research questions that maybe aren't being addressed. Um, the other thing that, that happens a lot in the philanthropic sector, not just, you know, not just at Sloan, but in other places, is that we rely on our peers a lot. So I'm regularly in contact with uh, my counterparts at other foundations, because they're hearing and seeing things uh, from their own disciplinary perspectives, from their own funding priority perspectives, and we often share ideas um, and, and, tr and trade perspectives back and forth to really try to uh, help each other out in lots of ways. So one of the things that folks often don't realize is that when you come to me and talk to me about your research project, if it's not a fit for me, I file that away and often uh, you know, try to keep that in mind so that when I'm out there talking with other donors, whether they be institutional foundations uh, or individuals, um, I have kind of a mental roster of things that I've come across that if they don't fit for us at Sloan, might actually be well worth it for other funders to support. The other thing that we often look at is, are there areas where there are multiple types of institutions that are getting engaged? So one of the things that I pride ourselves on is that while we fund a lot of work that's sort of more theory and, and abstract, 
the majority of the work that we do is really practical. And it involves scholars and researchers from economics, political science, other social sciences, increasingly engineering and the natural sciences that are working with data from the national labs, that are working with data from companies, that are generating their own data, that are sharing their data. So increasingly, one of the indicators to me of something that's really cutting edge is not just rerunning a model or trying to sort of uh, do a small tweak on, on an existing project, is going out and actually using data that hasn't been used for research purposes or generating their own data. That's one of the things that we look for a lot. And lastly, maybe I'll, j just to conclude, one of the things that, that I often hear is people don't have a sense of, as you said, how foundations work. And one of the, the reasons is that um, it takes time to get to know each individual foundation, like I said before. One of the things I often recommend to folks is to uh, really spend some time looking at the other work that the foundation has funded, talking to other grantees. You learn a lot from the social networks that foundations put themselves in, um, and that's often an underexplored area that folks don't take advantage of. That's, uh, that's good advice for anyone looking for uh, foundation funding. So I'd like then now to pivot a little bit uh, in the innovation space to partnerships as well. And um, uh, several years ago, uh, one of the other DOE uh, national laboratories, the um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, created a program called Cyclotron Road. And, uh, and it was uh, unique. And, and it was, I won't say controversial, but it was kind of different. Because we often think about the national laboratories developing new ideas and technology, and then wanting to take those outside the lab and commercialize them. But Cyclotron Road kind of did the opposite. It brought innovators from the outside into the national labs. And so I guess really, uh, Sebastian, I'd like to ask you to maybe tell us a little bit about how Cyclotron Road is working and, and what you see from the laboratory perspective, the value of these kind of partnerships from bringing in these uh, innovators. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I don't know what you're talking about, controversial. I haven't heard that before. Um, there, there have been several people that have come to I'm just, us I'm at the time kidding. that suggested that. <laughs> so, yeah, early on, we, we, um, Paul of Sados, who was the director of Lawrence Berkeley Lab at the time, made the observation that we often talk about spinning out technologies from national labs and universities, but that what we were really doing with Cyclotron Road was trying to spin people into the lab. So it's sort of a flipping, flipping the traditional tech transfer model on its head. So for, for those that don't know Cyclotron Road, what we do is we run what we call an entrepreneurial fellowship program. Um, every year we do a national competition. People apply from all over the country and all over the world uh, to basically pitch an idea that they have developed in their research that they would like to try to push toward a first product. Um, if you're accepted into the program, what you get is you get funding for two years to cover your salary. You get some research funding within Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and access to the tools and expertise and research there. And then our staff provides a bunch of coaching, networking opportunities, uh, mentorship related to the, the business aspect of taking that pro project toward a first product. Um, and so, so for those of you in the, the audience who are kind of more on the industry or investment side, you can kind of think of us as uh, whatever you think of as early stage, we're one step earlier than that. So we're really trying to prepare people and their ideas uh, to go from a stage where it's really just an academic concept to a place where they're much better prepared to actually bring in whatever kind of partnerships or funding they need to, to move that idea forward, whether that's venture capital investment or corporate partnerships or government funding. Um, for the grad students in the room, you can think of what we do as kind of an entrepreneurial postdoc. So uh, you're, you're coming in for two years, except instead of trying to publish and build your academic resume, your, your only goal is to try to push your idea toward a first product and kind of explore the commercial opportunity for that. Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of partnerships, uh, there, there's a number of ways in which partnerships play a role in, in what we do. Um, one of the main early drivers for starting this program was an observation that, particularly in, in clean energy, but this is true across, more broadly across any, any technologies that are based in physical goods where uh, you're developing something from a really early sort of scientific stage, uh, it takes a number of years before you really know what the, what the product is and what the right financing and partnership path is to actually bring that to market. Um, so one of the reasons that we felt this program was, well, there was a need for this program was that a lot of technologies were, especially out in Silicon Valley, 
a lot of clean energy technologies were being pushed into kind of uh, the VC uh, pipeline before people really knew whether they were actually a fit for that business model. And that led to a lot of, uh, a lot of, sort of pain and uh, a lot of projects that didn't actually succeed. Uh, and what we'd like to do with Cyclotron Road is give people a platform to spend some time actually thinking about the product, spend some time thinking about the path forward, and then actually point themselves in a direction that aligns with the right kinds of partners. Um, so in terms of partnerships, the National Lab is obviously the first key partner in doing that. Uh, it provides the, the research infrastructure that people need to really do that work. But then what we're seeing is that uh, with that kind of support, our teams uh, have the opportunity to actually build much earlier partnerships uh, with corporates or uh, choose to go down a path where they're initially raising mainly government grants or philanthropic funding, or in certain cases where they identify a really, uh, a really compelling story for venture capital, they're going right, right there and going down that path. But we're giving people a chance to explore those different partnership paths. Um, I'll say that I think one of the main partnership avenues that we find being really compelling for these types of things is working with, with big companies. Um, you heard Barbara up here, who's on, who's on our leadership council for Cyclotron Road, uh, talking about how there's a lot more appetite uh, in, in the corporate world for working with uh, innovators and, and smaller companies. And given the challenges of bringing something to market in energy, we find that working with uh, big companies that, act, that sort of know what the real deployment challenges are uh, as early as possible in the development of that idea can be really beneficial, and we're seeing some of our teams take advantage of that. Thanks. Yeah. I'd like to maybe ask, I know uh, uh, INL and NETL don't, at least at the moment, have a kind of a comparable program, but I, that I know that they have their own forms of partnerships in their own ways, and, and, this, and this notion about uh, marrying up your uh, in-house innovators with external innovators uh, I think is an important one. I'd ask if either of you would like to add a comment or two uh, on that point. Sure. I, INL, along with Oak Ridge and Argonne, run a program for DOE called the GAIN, Gateway to something, Innovation in Nuclear, <laughs> Accelerating Innovation in Nuclear. I guess it's late in the afternoon. So they run a program called GAIN, and it is designed exactly to get the nuclear industry, and particularly these small companies that are putting together these micro-reactors and small reactor concepts, access to the national lab expertise in nuclear energy. And so they write proposals for vouchers, which, uh, which doesn't give them any money, but it gives them access to the lab. So they can come in and, and actually have time paid for lab researchers to work with these small companies on their particular uh, technical issues. And they also run workshops and things like that. So there is, there is a, I think, a good program going on in nuclear at INL. And, and I have to say, we, I mean, we followed Cyclotron Road, we followed Chain uh, Reaction Innovations, and we're impressed with both. We're currently taking a look at I-Corp type uh, concepts and how we might implement something like that at NETL. We're slightly different than the other labs in that we're government-owned, government-operated, don't have the uh, GoCo model. And so we have to factor that in, how we might implement such a model. Uh, it can be done, we just have to factor in what that mo model might look like and uh, how we might provide that access, both from those coming from outside to inside and how those from inside going to outside might work. But it's something that we're evaluating. We find value uh, in that type of innovation and are looking to implement. Thanks. If, if I can just add very quickly, I, I, I should mention that there's also uh, programs uh, very similar to ours at both Oak Ridge National Lab and at Argonne National Lab. So at, at Argonne, it's called Chain Reaction Innovations, and actually Adria is in the very back of the room uh, from, from Chain Reaction. So if you're interested in that, that program, uh, speak to her, and then, and then at Oak Ridge, the program is called Innovation Crossroads. Uh, both of those programs are structured in a very similar way to Cyclotron Road, so, uh, and funded by DOE. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to uh, uh, move on now to another topic and, and ask the question, really, and ask all of you to think about this and address it. Um, uh, yesterday, we heard a very interesting address uh, by Tom Siebel about uh, the widespread application now of big data analytics, uh, the Internet of Things, and, and how that is, uh, his company is deploying that very widely in the energy industry. 
And I think we heard earlier today uh, from uh, Michael Sullivan when he was talking about uh, some of the work at Next Year. And, and w one of his, the points that he made that really uh, jumped out at me was I think he said he had 200 FTEs working on artificial intelligence within, within the company. And so the question I'd like to ask all of you is, is about what I would call, I'll call these platform technologies, technologies such as big data analytics, uh, uh, high performance computing, uh, robotics, uh, uh, additive manufacturing, technologies that are not energy technologies per se, um, technologies which uh, 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 there's a lot of work going on on this campus. And the question is, how do you see those technologies now impacting both the scope and the pace of uh, innovation as it gets applied in, in the clean energy technology area? And so maybe we might just go down the line here and I'll, we'll start with, uh, start with Paul. Uh, yeah, so you know, we, we started doing remote monitoring and diagnostics of our equipment about 20 years ago. And uh, at, in the beginning, it was human eyeballs watching all, these, all this data come in from our power plants all over the world. Um, about 12 or 15 years ago, we started using advanced algorithms uh, so that we had, you know, we, we started to automate that data monitoring and looking for anomalous behavior. In more recent years, we've been very heavily into machine learning and, and uh, other AI technologies. And so... We actually announced um, about a year and a half ago that we had broken ground on the world's first autonomous power plant. It's in Takasago, Japan. 600 megawatts combined cycle natural gas power plant, 65% efficient. And it's gonna be capable of doing things like uh, speaking to you in a natural language. It's going to be capable of uh, scheduling its own maintenance activities. When it needs parts, it'll order its own uh, parts. It'll schedule labor. When the, wind, when the weather changes, it, it will have a weather forecast and it will know that, hey, I, I scheduled this maintenance for a day when power, power demand is gonna be higher, I'm gonna reschedule that maintenance, in which case it'll reschedule the delivery of parts and labor and everything else. Um, it's gonna be capable of self-healing, so doing things, the simple things like stroking a valve that is, uh, that's stuck, um, but over time be, will be take on more and more self-healing capabilities so, and, and you know, we started out really focused on the, the equipment that we uh, provide to a power plant. There's a lot of equipment that other people provide to a power plant and our customers are now coming to us and saying, you know, your stuff has gotten so uh, reliable that it's, it's all that other stuff that's causing us downtime. So now they're asking us to monitor and, and do predictive maintenance on the rest of the power plant. Um, so at some point we're gonna run into the fence line of the power plant and I think at that time we're gonna start looking how are, we going to, how are we going to provide electricity that has intelligence embedded in it? And how are, when you use electricity that comes from one of our projects or one of our customers, how is that electricity going to uh, arrive? And maybe the major equipment that's using that electricity, how are we going to uh, use our monitoring technologies to, to provide remote uh, monitoring and maintenance for you know, your rock crusher or your, your, uh, you know, the major uh, equipment in, a, in an auto factory? So, we're really, uh, you know, we probably have a similar number of people working on AI in our company around the world, and uh, we definitely see this as a, a big driver for the industry. Thanks. Randy? Yeah, I, I don't think it's overstating it to just say that it's, um, it's going to be revolutionary in terms of things that we're looking at. It's emergent for us, but the two uh, example areas that I think that are going to have high impact uh, the first is going to be a true uh, physics-based approach in terms of using it to better understanding the subsurface. Uh, uh, very large data sets there in terms of exploratory potential. And the second is in terms of new alloy discovery, even with uh, three, four uh, mixture alloys and multi-parameter type space. Uh, it is combinatory impossible uh, to, to fully explore that space and understand that space. Um, and using these techniques uh, are already allowing us to better understand where some of the more optimal uh, designs lie. Yeah, great. I definitely agree with, with those trends. Uh, one of the areas, there, there are a number, a number of these areas that we see at Cyclotron Road, but one, one that we've, we've seen quite a bit over the last years is uh, how some of the developments in synthetic biology um, are being looked at from the perspective of materials manufacturing uh, or manufacturing of, of fuels, things like that. There, there was a wave of that about 
you know, 10, 15 years ago, there's sort of a second wave uh, that, that we're seeing now where there's a lot of folks working on um, how you apply some of the advances in synthetic biology to those fields. Um, we even have uh, a team that's, that's using cell-free uh, systems to, to basically do dis, you know, materials discovery, discover new pathways for how you can use biology to make things, uh, things in the real world. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole data analytics side to that as well. So, so that's, that's one of the, the big areas that we're seeing. I'd like to highlight advanced manufacturing and additive manufacturing. Uh, for nuclear that uh, Idaho is looking at quite a bit and also Oak Ridge. The idea here is that we could ex actually 3D print parts of reactors, make it cheaper to produce them. This is particularly uh, interesting for these lower pressure advanced reactor systems that we're thinking about uh, putting forward in the micro reactor domain. So that, and also just advanced manufacturing in extreme environments. So things like uh, high temperatures, high pressures, high radiation. We also do quite a bit of high performance computing in the nuclear realm as well. So this is an area where, where we get lots of questions and inquiries, as you can imagine. And uh, one of the things that we try to do is kind of separate out the hype from reality, but one of the challenges that you hear about is that the reality is constantly changing. So how do you do that? Um, so one thing that we did is we actually have an ongoing research project uh, being organized by uh, researchers at the Environmental Law Institute Yale University and UC Berkeley. It's called the Program on Energy and Environmental Implications of the Digital Economy. And what it's doing is it put out an open call for uh, proposals. It got 35 submissions. It's funding eight academic research projects that are looking at both the implications and applications of AI and uh, sharing platforms on energy and environmental systems. So both the applications and use of those technologies like you heard here and potentially some of the negative implications as well. Um, they actually just released uh, yesterday or today an inventory of supposed blockchain app uh, applications in the energy environmental space that will be updated um, and, and, and evolve over time. Um, so for, for me and for us at Sloan, it's a really interesting research question um, and one where I'm actually just kind of interested to know some of the answers. Okay. Good. You know, one just quick thing. You know, my wife bought a, an XC60 uh, from Volvo, and um, one of the things I was reading through, I don't know why, I was reading through the manual, you know, they've set a target to never have a human fatality in that car, and, and the, the way they're doing that is with driver assist and, I mean, well, some of the, you know, safety features of the car, but the real game changer is, you know, autonomous vehicle technology. And, um, you know, in, in our industry, you know, the, the not quite as, uh, well, the similar equivalent is, you know, we can actually set a goal to never have unplanned maintenance in a power plant. And, and by the way, unplanned maintenance and, and, and loss production is a huge economic impact on my customers. So um, AI really allows us to set these really sort of audacious goals that, you know, uh, that, that don't sound quite as, unreal, uh, as, as unrealistic when you can apply these, these AI technology. Great. Well, th no, there's a lot of really interesting ideas there. And I see that I think uh, our time is just about up. I wish we could go on uh, longer. But let me ask everybody one really quick rapid fire question, uh, really addressed to the, to the audience here. And we, you know, we have a lot of both current and future innovators out there and, and many people looking at uh, either planning on or thinking about careers in the energy innovation space. Any quick thoughts that any of you might have or any quick ideas about uh, a particular area that, that they might want to think about going into? We just launched a new company. We announced it this week at CMU Energy Week. It's here in Pittsburgh. It's a, a renewables and battery storage development company. And, uh, and we, we definitely feel like uh, distributed power and, dis and distributed storage is going to be a big part of the future. You're taking applications? Yes, sir. In fact, we've got <laughs> two CMU interns already. Well, I think for us, integrated systems uh, is a very important uh, area of, of research. So these systems working together is going to be uh, an area of innovation. And part of that is going to be uh, AI probably in the future. Yeah, I'll make a shameless plug. A, num a number of our teams that go through our program end up, end up hiring and looking for uh, smart young people to come and work work for their their startups as they get going. So, uh, well, you know, if you visit our website, there's there's always opportunities to get involved. 
cybersecurity. <laughs> so in grantees, I look for folks that follow their passion and that follow through and do what they say they're going to do. So if you follow those two principles, I think you'll be in good shape. Okay, great. I think we're about done here, so, and I'll turn it back to you. And, and thank you, uh, members of the panel. You really were uh, heavy hitters, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Once again, let's give a big round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much.